Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. We'll get started in just a minute to let everyone join and get connected. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session of the Women Veterans Empowerment Webinar Series. Um, during today's webinar, we will be learning about what's happening on, the, on Capitol Hill. We have Heather Ansley, PVA's AED of Government Relations, and Maureen Elias, Associate Legislative Director of Government Relations. We have closed captioning available for today's webinar. To turn this on, click the show subtitles button in the meeting control bar. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A box to submit your question and the panelists will answer as we go. Um, during the presentation today, we will ask for your feedback. So to share your input, you can use the raise your hand feature and then we will call on you to allow you to talk. At the end, we'll open up to general questions, and you can use the Q&A box or the raise your hand feature to ask your question out loud. Um, the webinar today is being recorded, and you will receive um, a copy of the, a link to the recording and a copy of the slides. And now I'll hand it over to Heather to start. Thanks. Thank you, Marissa, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending where you are across the nation today. Thank you for taking the opportunity to uh, connect with us on today's webinar focused on what's happening on Capitol Hill. As you know, the, the nation has uh, had a, an interesting few months as we have uh, dealt with a number of issues um, and those certainly have uh, played out on Capitol Hill as well. Uh, the Hill is not uh, the most tech savvy of places and uh, it has been uh, quite a, a couple of months as they have begun to learn how to hold hearings and other meetings using uh, virtual communication such as that we're using today to connect. Um, and they are slowly creaking back to life um, and beginning to uh, hold hearings and do the things that they would uh, typically do. Usually uh, June and July are some of our busiest months, uh, particularly in an, a, a presidential election year as we have this year. Uh, they typically signal some of the last uh, good legislative calendar days before we get into the August recess, the party, uh, conventions and then uh, the downtime as members of Congress are in their states and districts running for uh, re-election in November. Uh, so certainly um, there is, uh, although we're in a bit of a different uh, June and July than what we had envisioned, um, certainly there is still a lot going on um, on the Hill and several efforts that we are undertaking on behalf of all paralyzed veterans uh, but also specifically um, our women uh, members, and we want to recognize um, those efforts today. Uh, our focus on uh, some of the women veterans issues in policy um, and in our Hill work um, really took off last year uh, with the creation of the Anita Bloom Committee um, at the convention in Denver. And having the opportunity for that to really uh, segue and, or to connect with some of the heightened efforts on the Hill to really address the needs of women veterans has led to some, some good synergy for the efforts of PVA as we look to highlight um, within the women veterans community the needs of, of women veterans who have um, spinal cord injuries um, and diseases. 
the uh, during this time we have been involved with um, the House Veterans Affairs Committee, Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, and most particularly on the House Veterans Affairs Committee side, they have developed a Women Veterans Task Force that has been meeting um, on a somewhat regular basis, less regular now uh, in the time of, of the pandemic, uh, but a lot of open communication directly with members of Congress um, on a variety of issues that uh, impact our women veterans. We've also, uh, as PVA, been working to lead an informal uh, group of other veteran service organizations talking about women veterans issues specifically. And that's something that in, in my time in the veteran space, um, we haven't uh, taken the time to have those specific conversations. So the fact that we are now doing that is a big step forward. Um, and of course, uh, the, our business of what we do on a, a regular basis is testifying uh, at hearings and commenting on legislation. We've had um, a lot of opportunities um, over the last couple of years um, to, to uh, weigh in. Uh, in fact, as early as this morning, Maureen Elias had the opportunity to testify on the Hill, um, and she's going to get uh, involved in discussing some of those issues related to the testimonies and, and other efforts, weighing in on legislation. Uh, you know, we want to remind uh, the Hill that again, uh, the issues of, of women veterans, women veterans are not are not one group, monolithic group, that they are a diverse group, as diverse as the veteran community themselves, um, and that we want to make sure that the, uh, you know, we have all of the access that is needed. So some of our priorities that we have um, undertaken throughout this year, and if you happen to attend um, our uh, legislative seminar that we held back in March, um, you are aware that we did do a um, one of our uh, point papers for this year's Hill event did, was about women veterans issues, uh, which was something that in my in my time here we have not uh, done. So that was a new effort for us, and we wanted to um, look at improving access to VA programs, services, and facilities. Uh, for our uh, women members and, and other women who, who may have similar needs. Um, ensure that we have compassionate, quality, quality gender-inclusive healthcare services. Of course, that's something that all women veterans um, must have through the VA. And then specifically to increase um, the awareness of the needs of our women veterans with spinal cord injuries and disorders uh, to make sure that uh, they understand that broad diversity. So uh, Maureen is now going to uh, walk us through each of these uh, three areas and have the opportunity to go more in depth. Maureen joined us last December. Uh, she attended the first women's retreat um, that was held by PVA uh, last fall. Uh, she is a, a veteran and uh, a current uh, military spouse. Um, so we would like to uh, welcome Maureen to walk us through these efforts. Maureen. Thanks, Heather. And thanks, everyone, for attending today's webinar. It's always fun to get to share the work that we're doing um, on the Hill and off the Hill. Uh, so one of the, as I, as I took, started working on the Women Veteran Health Portfolio for PVA, one of the things I quickly learned is, is how little um, individuals on the Hill know and understand about women veterans with SCID care. Um, and I had to educate myself as well because that was a newer topic to me. Um, and one of the things that I've learned from having conversations with the Anita Bloom Committee and other women veteran members is that one of the biggest barriers to care when it comes to our population is the physical access to VA facilities as well as when you're going in the community for care. Um, simple things such as entrances to the facility um, Tammy Jones has talked about uh, how she had to sit outside a, a VA facility because the, the, the button that would allow her access wasn't working and she wasn't able to manipulate the handles and the desk wasn't situated in a way that they could see that she was sitting out there waiting for access. So that's one of the things that we always try to remember or try to remind our um, congresspersons that, that 
that just physical access is a barrier to care. And once the veteran's inside the building, once you all are inside, then we wanna make sure that the building excel itself is accessible to you, that the doorways are wide enough to facilitate a wheelchair, that the, the rooms are wide enough for you to maneuver around in, that they have the right equipment, such as lifts or accessible tables to make sure that you're able to get the examinations that you need. Um, and in doing so, it, what that helps do is make sure that you have the privacy to have the conversations that you need to be having with your physician. Um, in fact, the, to, at today's hearing, Chairman Levin asked the question about what is needed in um, VA facilities in order to make sure that they are accessible. And so we let him know that we'll get back to him with, with a much more thorough answer, but we let him know that physical access is a barrier to care and, and we'll be sure to let him know what all we see needs to be improved in order to make sure that our members have access to uh, the VA as well as especially to women VA health clinics because you know what the research is showing is, um, and as a woman veteran myself, I'm paying close attention, is that women veterans who are using the VA Women Health Services are doing well, that that program is doing a good job of meeting our needs. However, if our women veterans with SCID can't access those clinics, then they're not getting that best health care possible. And so we want to make sure that you know access to VA Women Health Clinics is, is occurring. Um, part of that issue too is maintenance. You know, like I said, the the the, the button that opens the door, uh, if that's not working, what's the point? You know, it's not an accessible clinic. So making sure that that those safeties are there and that they are functioning and working. Um, Inclusion is, is very important to me. Uh, I've been a veteran for about 15 years. I've been to a lot of women veteran retreats and employment events and, um, uh, you know, other activities. And I, it wasn't until the PVA Women Veteran Empowerment Retreat that I ever met a woman veteran with an SDID. And to me, I think that, that that's shameful because the women that I met so inspired me and were so wonderful that I ended up applying to work at PVA because I liked the environment so much. And so that's been a, a talking point of mine whenever I have the opportunity is making sure that you know, as women veterans, uh, our members aren't excluded from these activities that are tailored towards us and making sure that the, these activities are accessible so that we can all get to know each other because we're always, you know, stronger together as a community if we know each other. Um, the, the, the Deborah Sampson Act, um, which I'll discuss a little bit later, it had some grants in there for some women veteran specific retreats. And one of the talking points that we had in there is making sure that any anyone who's receiving a grant from the VA for a woman veteran specific retreat is going to have a plan on how that retreat can be accessible to our women veterans and making sure that they can be included in those activities. Uh, we recently had a meeting with the, the lead staffer, her name is Heather O'Brien Kelly, um, and she is their new mental health HVAC staffer on the majority side. And um, we had submitted some comments on um, S-785, which is the Commander John Scott Hannon Act, as well as H.R. 5697, which is the Veterans Access Act. Um, and one of the things that we pointed out is that, you know, all of these efforts targeted to lower the rate of veteran suicide and improve veteran mental health care are pointless if they aren't accessible to our service or to our veterans. So uh, we, we submitted written comments on those and Heather reported back to me that every comment that we had suggested to help our members be more included has been included in the current um, draft legislation. So we're really excited to see that that the conversations we're having on the Hill are really starting to take effect in the, the legislation that's being drafted. Um, we also, you know, it's really important. There's a lot of very sensitive conversations that we need to be having with our healthcare providers, conversations around, you know, our periods and conversations around menopause and conversations around our sexual health. And so it's really important that, that the VA is creating an environment where you can have those conversations. And, you know, it goes back to physical access. If you can't get into the room, if you can't get into the clinic and you're having to have that appointment in the hallway, um, you're losing a, a lot of, of privacy and may not be as comfortable having the conversations that we need to have uh, with our healthcare providers. So that's, you know, become a very powerful point for me as I'm advocating on the Hill. Um, and then we also want to ensure that um, when it comes to VA research that our, our population is included. 
we know that the, you know, the women veteran population within the SCID community for veterans is relatively small. It's only about 3% um, of the population, but just because it's a small cohort doesn't mean that your needs aren't important. And so, you know, we're advocating both with VA headquarters as well as with the VA research teams to make sure that you are included in any research that's being conducted when it comes to veteran health. Um, and then also ensuring that visibility and representation um, at clinics is occurring as well. Um, when it comes to VA harassment, um, I'm really thankful to see that this topic is being brought up both within VA and on the Hill. Um, as a woman veteran, the first time I went into a VA clinic to receive care, um, I, was, I was discharged for a medical issue and I went into the VA to get care and the lady at the front desk started yelling at me that, you know, my husband couldn't wait in the car. I couldn't sign him up for services. And I tried to explain to her that I was a woman veteran and she wouldn't even listen to it to me. Um, and so, you know, the harassment isn't always just male to female. It's sometimes it can come from the staff and, and sometimes it can come from, you know, all different ways. And so we want to make sure that, you know, we view harassment within the VA as a barrier to care. And so some of the things that we've been doing to, to improve that situation is meeting, we've met multiple times with the, the personnel that are in charge of the stand up to end harassment campaign at the VA. And we've talked to them about some of the issues that our members have reported to us. Um, and one of the things that we pointed out is there's really not a clear reporting channel or chain of command. Who do we report to when harassment is occurring? Do we talk to the staffer at the desk? Do we go to the patient advocacy team? Do we go to the police? Um, and also the lack of repercussions. You know, if, if my rights as a patient are violated by another patient, what happens then? Um, they do have a couple of working groups that have just concluded the results have not been published yet, but we're keeping a close eye to find out what those working groups report because we're pretty sure that's going to have a very strong influence on what um, policies and procedures they put in place. So, you know, we have a nice open relationship with um, those VA employees and we're hoping that we can continue that to make sure that our women veterans are protected. Um, and there may need to be some legislative fixes down the line. Um, there is a hearing coming up, I want to say on the 22nd, to talk about VA harassment and we will be submitting a statement for record. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you all can support us as we go forward with crafting and, and creating that legislation. Next slide, please. Okay, so quality health care. Um, today's hearing focused on reproductive health care and one of the important parts when we talk about reproductive health care is the reproductive cancers. For women veterans, we have a higher incidence rate of breast cancers and we also contract it younger. And so sometimes, especially when we're going for care in the community, uh, our health care providers aren't always taught about that. Uh, one, one positive note is that the VA actually has a pretty successful rate of screening women veterans for breast cancer that is higher than among our civilian population. What I would like to know and something we can talk about later in this webinar is whether or not you're seeing that amongst yourselves. Are you being reminded to to get your screenings? Are you, you know, being followed up on um, once you've had that screening? Is it making it back into your electronic health care record? Um, when you go into the community for that care, because it seems like for our women veteran population, many of them are being sent to the community for the, their mammogram care. Uh, is the facility you're being sent to, does it have the appropriate staff? Does it have the appropriate equipment? Do they know about the concerns that you have regarding your breast health? Um, and again, is, is that information making it back into your electronic health care record in the VA? Um, when it comes to birth control, one of the key uh, topics on the Hill right now is access to contraception. Um, there's legislation out there right now to uh, not have a copay on preventative health care, which uh, medications, which would include your contraceptives. Um, there's a bill out there to, to help address that, and that was definitely one of the topics in the hearing today. Um, one of the things that, that PVA and the independent budget that we belong to um, have advocated for was no copay on those contraceptives. 
Um, but we, it's also really important to us that providers both inside and outside of the VA have a knowledge of the unique contraceptive concerns that our women veterans have, such as deep vein thrombosis and, you know, other interactions between contraceptives and medications that you might be taking. Um, and then when it comes to family planning, one of the things that our research has shown is that providers don't always ask women the question about family planning when they have a spinal cord injury. And so one of the things we advocated for both in our written statement and in our oral statement is that providers need to be asking questions about what your desires are to have a family, whether you have that desire, when you're planning on doing it, how many you're planning on having. Um, and then we're advocating for permanent IVF services. That's our number one priority this year. Um, when it comes to reproductive health care is, is not only getting IVF reauthorized, but getting it permanently authorized and going further to get surrogacy and gamut donation added to the list of procedures that the VA offers, because especially for our women veterans, you know, those can be two big barriers to getting, you know, to having the family if that's their desire. And so we want to make sure that they have that available. Um, when it comes to a lot of people don't put the connection between prosthetics and, um, you know, reproductive health care, but there are a lot of um, assistive devices and technologies that are out there to help women veterans have a, a healthier sex life. And as we go through the, you know, menopause and other changes of a reproductive health, they have a lot of supports and services to help us with that. But I don't think there's a lot of education happening on what they offer. So that's something I would really be interested to learn from you all is, are they having those, are your healthcare providers letting you know what PSAS uh, offers for you all for your reproductive health care? Is there more that they could be doing to make sure that you're having a healthy sexual life? Um, we do have one of the things that we're currently working on right now is prosthetics along with the LGBTQ veteran program, as well as reproductive health, as well as women health, is they're getting together um, basically an educational forum for the VSOs to let us know what all they do offer for reproductive health care for our veterans. Um, we're also working with uh, VA veteran research leaders, Dr. Yano and Dr. Washington. Um, they for the last couple of months, we've been in conversations with them and they have recognized that there is definitely a huge gap in knowledge for our women veterans with SCI as far as the research goes. And so um, we're working with them to help ensure that, that our population is included in future research studies as well as help to find maybe where those major gaps are so we can start filling them in. Um, and then whenever we advocate on the Hill for women veteran needs, we are asking for more research because until we have the research, we, we're just taking educated guesses as to what the needs and gaps in care are. Next slide, please. So some of the things that as I've worked on the Hill and advocated, I've noticed um, a real need for is educating uh, the congressmen and women and their staffers on what some of the special health care needs are of our women veterans. Some of those can be the risks of deep vein thrombosis, um, autonomic dysreflexia. I know I had to learn what that was and as I learned about all the different things that can cause a body to go into that condition, it's, it's alarming and concerning that, that more people aren't aware of this condition. Um, things such as loss of muscle tone, um, lack of sensation. Um, one of the things we talked about in our testimony today is that sometimes the assumption can happen among providers that just because you're not feeling sensations below the waist means you're not having sex, which is absolutely untrue. We know that women veterans are having sex and they're having it for, for a multitude of reasons. One, because they want and crave that intimacy with their partner. Another one could be for reproduction. Another one could be to um, you know, maybe they want sex. I mean, those are things that we need to be comfortable talking about and we need, um, you know, people on the Hill as well as VA leaders to understand that this is a, a normal and healthy part of our lives and it can't be overlooked just because it's an uncomfortable topic to talk about. Uh, another thing is when it comes to pressure sores, sometimes our members can be viewed as fidgety uh, because they'll move around in their wheelchairs and, and what our members don't, our congressmen and women don't always recognize is that that's being done in order to avoid um, obtaining a pressure sore, which can really have an adverse effect on their health. Um, and there's more that I know that we don't know. So this is where you can really help educate us on the things that 
that we may not be talking about and also to educate our congressmen and women so they can really understand what you're going through, what your experience is like. Next slide, please. So it, it's really exciting to see the, the focus of women veterans on the Hill. Since the creation of the Women Veteran Task Force, there have been all kinds of topics brought up that really weren't a part of the mainstream conversation before. Um, there was a March 11th hearing that um, on women veteran mental health that uh, we submitted a statement for record for. And as I was preparing for that, what I realized is there's just a devastatingly lack of research when it comes to women veteran mental health and the SCI community. And so that was one of our heaviest hitting points is just the need for more information so we can know what the needs are, what's going on. Um, and also to make sure that as research is being conducted, our population isn't being left out of that research because the, there are differences. And if we're not recognizing those, then we can't be treating those differences. Um, in the hearing for reproductive health today, um, we were one of the few that brought up the topic of reproductive mental health. And to pretend that our sexual health and our sexual activity does not affect our mental health or is not affected in the other direction is to bury our head in the sand and, and really not look at the problem holistically. And um, the, I cannot remember her name, but the uh, Congresswoman from the Samoa Islands, she, she commented on the fact that we had spoken up about mental health and that she was glad to see that there. Um, there's also been a hearing on the continuum of healthcare during natural disasters and pandemics that uh, we submitted at SFR for to make sure that our veterans are being taken care of. Um, there's a couple of upcoming hearings. Um, like I said, there's the one on the 22nd about harassment in the VA. And one thing that would be really valuable for us is if you are comfortable and willing to share with us your experiences of harassment at the VA, if you've had any, um, so we can know what that picture looks like. Um, Tammy Jones has been brave enough to share with me some of her stories and um, I've had some of my own. And so if, if, if we really want to address this issue, we have to talk about what's happening. And, and so if you're comfortable sharing that with us, you'll have our contact information at the end and, and you can reach out and share your stories with us. Um, what, what I'm curious about when it comes to harassment at the VA is, um, is your experience different? As a woman veteran with an SCI, do you experience a different form of harassment at the VA than um, an, a different woman veteran might? And so, uh, you know, is the assumption that you are a veteran when you go into an SCI clinic, um, or are you assumed to be a caregiver or a spouse or a daughter or, you know, another person? So I, I look forward to hearing your stories about about what you're seeing, or if you're not seeing, if you're having positive experiences at the VA, that's important for us to hear as well. Um, then there is an upcoming hearing on employment. I want to say it's on July 21st. And we do know that women veterans have been more heavily impacted by job loss throughout the COVID pandemic. And so we'll be putting together our research and drafting up that statement. Again, if you want to share your experiences with us and how COVID has affected you employment wise, we would love to hear that. Um, as Heather talked about, we have kind of created a, or been working with an informal group of BSOs to talk about women veterans um, in the community. And we recently led a roundtable with Andrea Goldstein, where we were able to sit and have a really nice fleshed out conversation about what the needs are that we're seeing uh, in the women veteran community. And we were able to address what we're seeing within the women veteran SCID community. And we are preparing another one with um, staffer Tiffany Wolfuck in order to discuss some of the things that are happening within the Deborah Sampson Act. Um, that should be coming in the next week or two. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. So the great thing about, you know, women veterans being highlighted on the Hill and the Women Veteran Task Force is that there, there has been some wonderful legislation introduced in the last couple of years in the 116th Congress. Two that we very strongly support and are advocating actively for is HR 955 and the Companion 7 Senate Bill 319, which is the Women, Veteran and Families Health Services Act. And what that bill does is permanently authorizes IVF and it also adds the option for surrogacy and gamut donation, which we think would be really valuable to our members. Um, HR 2803, while not specifically veteran focused, focuses on healthcare provision for those who have 
and I'm get, probably going to butcher this, but iatrogenic infertility, which is infertility that's been caused by medical treatment. And so to give you a good example of that, that might be um, chemotherapy um, or radiation in a, you know, certain areas of your body will, will take away your opportunity to have a, to procreate without assistive reproductive technology. Um, there's, there's other, the Deborah Sampson Act has passed the House, the version that passed the House we really like because it did specifically call for research among our women veterans with SCI. Um, we're still kind of holding on what's happening with that on the Senate side. Um, and then there's other legislation out there like HR 3798, which would eliminate your co-pays on your contraceptives. Um, there's HR 3036, which would allow for better retrofitting of the VA to make sure that our, our women veterans have access to uh, physical VA facilities, as well as ensuring that all facilities have a full-time or a part-time specific designated women health provider. Um, and then there's HR 2645, which extends the amount of time that the VA would provide newborn care from seven to 14 days. Um, there's, there's other pieces of legislation out there. I just wanted to bring some of them to your attention and let you know that we are actively advocating to improve your health care and benefits. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it back well, thank over you. to Heather. <laughs> thank you, Maureen, for uh, giving that uh, comprehensive overview of the issues. So, um, we have been following uh, in some of the areas of focus that we have um, on behalf of our women veterans. As Maureen noticed, uh, you know, we're not just looking at women veterans issues in the context of women specific legislation or health, but we're also looking at uh, the issues of women that come up in other contexts, such as employment and benefits, uh, to make sure that we are understanding the intersections between being a veteran, being a woman, uh, being a person of color. Uh, we want to understand how all of those um, uh, different uh, things that make us up uh, work together to, to maybe cause barriers um, or create risk um, to care. So one of the, I've, I've already seen several uh, good comments on the uh, chat box and Q&A of some of your experiences and ideas. And this is where we wanted to uh, take an opportunity to hear a little bit from you um, after you've heard from us. Um, one of the things that we need your help with is to um, understand um, as we're, uh, you know, we'll be putting together our policy priorities for uh, 2021. Um, this fall, and we want to understand um, from you what are some of the specific areas that we should focus on that would help uh, women veterans with SDI um, in various um, areas within the VA. So we're going to take each one of these questions separately um, and uh, have the opportunity to have you give your feedback uh, live. You can also put it in the, in the Q&A box or the chat box if that makes you more comfortable. Um, but if you would like to speak um, and give your thoughts first on how we can, uh, what PVA should be focusing on in the access to VA healthcare and services, if you could uh, raise your hand, there's a raise your hand uh, feature um, in your participant um, link and uh, Marissa can unmute you uh, so that you will be able to answer the question. Uh, so if you would uh, raise your hand now um, and Marissa can uh, highlight uh, those individuals that wish to speak. Uh, Marissa, do we have anyone um, who has indicated they would like to talk with us today? Yes, we have Laquantis. Go ahead, Laquantis. Hi. Um, so a few things. I think the VA needs to, um, two things. They need to um, I'll give you an example with radiology. I went in there and I'm trying to tell radiology that I'm not your traditional patient. I'm a spinal cord patient. And so they were like, oh yeah, we know, we know, we know. No, you don't know. So first of all, they want to talk about what they know. And that just irritates me because if you, if I have not explained to you what type of spinal cord injury I have, how do you know? So they need mm -hmm. to re-educate the people when it comes to when you're dealing with a spinal cord patient and they have to transfer from their chair to another location, listen to what we have to say first, then make your assessment. Because I had, I was getting in an argument with the radiologist and um, 
because she kept telling me, you know, that was one issue that I had with radiology. Then another issue I had when I was inpatient and they, was, they wanted to do um, an x-ray, an in-bed x-ray. And I wasn't, for me, I wasn't covered properly. And so the male technician was trying to downplay. I'm like, hold up, this is my body here. And you know, I know what's exposed. So anyway, I got irritated and I did report it. They did, I spoke to the supervisor, but the point is that goes back to education. And you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we're already sensitive. We don't feel everything. And so that's, that's, an, and that's another segue. So you think because you're sticking something in the back there, I'm telling you, don't, don't, don't go so hard because I can't feel it. I don't know what you're doing back there. So it just, I had bad experience with them not listening to me. And I'm very vocal when it comes to my body because if anything happens to my body, then I'm responsible. Then I'm upset and then, you know, the rest of the problem. So they need to be educated. Um, what else? Um, so, uh, and that I did have positive experiences with the VA, but right now we'll come back to it. But basically what they need to be educated on for me is um, how to non- uh spinal cord knowledge people they need to understand when we transfer what what we need to do in short or what they need to understand about our bodies thank you uh laquantas and it sounds like um those are issues that maybe are encountered when you're uh having you're having to seek the services that are outside of the sci uh clinic and where people uh the providers are knowledgeable about those issues once you head into some of the other parts of the hospital in this case radiology where you've encountered people who are not properly educated on how to assist you um right. so it, yeah that is definitely something uh that we will look at um as we talk about ensuring that you know all of the services of va are not only are the physical uh rooms and uh, machines accessible, but um, making sure that staff are educated to, number one, listen, um, and to uh, be educated about um, how to help their patients. So thank you for, uh, for raising that issue to us. Okay. And then my other issue was, because um, I put in there for the mammogram, because I have, I have um, breast cancer in my family, and so long story short, they say, okay, you need to have an MRI and a mammogram once a year. So you have to, so I'm not, because it hasn't, it has not been done once a year like it was supposed to. Now I'm kind of lost on was it every other year now? But the point is, they, I spoke to the doctor, they found something that was non cancerous, but they, how do I say it? They didn't follow up to make sure that whatever I was supposed to get, I was suppo I'm supposed to get week, I mean, yearly, annually. So they cut, mm -hmm. someone dropped the ball. I don't know who it was that's supposed to remind me. Um, so that was, and I don't know where I stand with that right now. So that's something that the VA needs to, or the PVA can help out with. Um, and then my last one was with my, within the, within the VA, within the spinal cord family, um, I had an issue with my, MS coordinator, the nurse, and I'm following up with him to make sure I got my medication. It's supposed to be the other way. I'm following up with him to make sure I get my appointments. But that's that's not that's what you get paid for. That's your job. You're supposed to schedule appointments and not me schedule not me hounding you for an appointment. So some and he's been mm -hmm. like that for a while. I don't understand what's what what's what is the disconnect, but that was an issue that I've had. Well, thank you for, again, for raising that. It's very important for us to hear these, um, these stories. And, and what, what VA center do you use, may I ask? Um, I use Miami VA and I use West Palm. Okay, thank you. I think West Palm, because it's not as, I think Miami gets it more maybe because the, the hub is there. West Palm, mm -hmm. not so much. And there's not that many female veterans that are, I don't, I don't know too many PVA female veterans in West Palm. I know more males than I know females. Thank you. Marissa, do we have any other uh, individuals on the line? Um, no one has their hand raised, but if anybody else would like to give any input, please raise your hand and we can unmute you and allow you to share your feedback.
while right. we're we have Ann Robinson. All right, go ahead, Ann. Good afternoon, Ann. Uh, hi, Heather. Good morning. Sorry, computer problem. Um, no problem. I just wanted to follow up. Thank you guys for doing this. Go to sleep. Uh, follow up on what Laquanus was talking about on the mammograms. Uh, I put in the question and the answer, but of all the things that the VA has, I think is lacking in, uh, I think if maybe if you're a pair or something and you go over and you do a mammogram, you might have uh, some luck using the machinery, but as a quad, uh, it is almost impossible. Uh, we actually look back at four years of mammograms and like only a quarter of the picture was really there. Um, mm. So, you know, it doesn't, I guess they try their best and they do what they do with, with regular folks, but education or finding alternative methods um, Maybe if, I, I don't know if there's any studies or research or anything going on, but I, I think that this is definitely one area where um, PVA could really help dive in and, and make a difference because uh, here in San Antonio, it's not so well. So if she's experiencing that in Florida, I think that maybe we definitely have, definitely have something to work for. So that's what I have. Thank you guys. Thank you, Anne. It, it certainly sounds like, I, I would imagine if we, if we o had everyone open the lines, everyone probably has a, a similar story. And, um, you know, this is very helpful uh, for us to hear because a lot of times the conversation around women veterans and mammography and, and, and screenings, it's about, are they going? It's not, it's not, okay, yes, they are coming, but the screening is inadequate. And it's because the machinery isn't, able to get a proper picture or the technician doesn't know uh, how to best do that. Um, so certainly these are the exact kind of things that, that we really do want to hear from you. Yes. Is there anyone else, Marissa? Oh, and yeah. did you have something else? Oh, no, that's it. Thank you, guys. All right. And now we have Tammy. All right, Tammy, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys, for the for the show for the uh, for the opportunity to hear all this today. Um, my first one would be a follow up for what uh, Ann and, and Heather were talking about in and Laquantis as far as the um, the access. Uh, I, I, I think one more thing we have to look at in that in that realm would be um, in today's environment of the COVID nineteen. Um, they're not allowing. Um, any family members or caregiver to, or I shouldn't say any caregivers. I, I went to an appointment with my husband yesterday and all family member, or I had to sit in the hallway. I couldn't go into the appointment with him or back uh, or wait in the lobby, uh, the waiting room. So I guess what I'm trying to say is from this point forward, we need to make sure that we stress that when it comes time for these mammograms um, or our, our um, appointments where they're gonna need possibly need our assistance, the assistance of our um, of our caregivers to help position us um, that they need to take in, they need to remember that that uh, that our caregivers can be there to help uh, position or to answer to help with uh, <clears throat> with doing doing the test that's needed. There we go. I'll get it out. <laughs> and uh, then um, then the second thing was, uh, as I as I asked in the questions, was um, would you like for us to contact our representatives or sen senators on any of the pending bills, or um, what what would how can we help you guys um, on the hill with these issues? That's all. Well, thanks, Tammy. <laughs> uh, I think I think one of the the key. Uh, pieces of legislation that we mentioned that that's one of our top priorities relates to IVF. Um, and Maureen, maybe you could just briefly talk about that legislation, HR 955. And um, 
I think we've had the, the, the women's committee reach out on that in the past, but I think it'd be good to give folks an update and um, you could take that over. Sure, absolutely. Um, I would like to add in uh, how, how grateful I am for, for those of you women who are sharing your stories. Uh, and I wanna give you an example of why it's successful. Um, I ended up meeting with Tammy and Ann and I wanna say Cheryl, prior to uh, one of the hearings that I spoke on and the, the concept of caregiver violence during uh, COVID was brought up and, and we fleshed that out and I presented that before Congress and they, the VA has actually already adapted their policies and is working to um, incorporate that into the questions that they are asking uh, veterans who have caregivers. So, so please know your, your input is so very valuable to us and does not go unheeded. Um, as far as HR 955 and Senate 319, um, they are slowly gathering, um, it seems about once or twice a week we're getting more co-sponsors involved, but the most impactful thing that you all can do is reach out to your representatives and senators and either thank them if they have already signed the legislation or ask them why they haven't, what their reservations are. Um, and we would be happy to, you know, to send you the talking points paper that we've devised about why this is so important to our members. Uh, but with, you know, the NDAA going on right now, timing is essential to get it reauthorized. But the, the important thing is, is trying to get 955 and, and 319 passed because then we don't have to play this game every two years and, and it will finally be a permanent part of the services. And so when you reach out to your representatives and you know, ask them to, to sign the bill. The, the important thing is, is that this is becoming a permanent service and it's already offered to DOD personnel. Um, the restriction on the VA is, is an inequity, um, but we are, it is slowly moving forward, but your help in reaching out to your representatives could really have a very positive impact, especially in the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Maureen. And what we will do is we will provide to um, uh, Marissa and Hannah our information um, that Maureen mentioned, um, the talking information, so that you will be able to have that and we'll have that come along with the slides and the uh, recording of today's webinar. Um, I think one of the most exciting things about uh, that legislation is not only would it make um, the permanent benefits, uh, but it would also provide an expansion of the services that are available uh, and they're really the services needed to help women veterans. So very um, exciting that we are, we are really starting to see um, more understanding of the need for those services and we're hopeful, uh, we're, we're very optimistic we will get at least a renewal, but we're, what we really want is a permanent benefit that is expanded to make sure in particular women veterans are able to uh, have children and grow their families if that's something that they desire to do. Marissa, do we have anyone else on the line? Um, there's no one that has their hand raised. I think we can move on to the next question. All right, very good. Um, so one of the, in addition to healthcare and services, which is what we've covered a lot today, we also wanted to hear um, if there were any issues uh, related to VA benefits, and I'm going to group just for time's sake, employment and education, particularly, and you may know within the VA, you've got Veterans Health Administration and the Veterans Benefits Administration, and at the Veterans Benefits Administration is where we have disability comp and pension, uh, voc rehab, uh, well, that has a new name now, voc rehab has a new name, but still the same services. Um, and also GI Bill benefits and other educational services. So is there, is there anything um, in that bucket of what you might traditionally think of as benefits that you feel like um, is something as, as women veterans with SDID is an area that we really need to focus on? And we'll give just a minute for a hand raise. Yes, if you have any input, um, if you don't feel comfortable speaking out loud, you can also put it in the chat box and we can talk about it. Um, or if you use the raise your hand feature, we can open the line up for you. And as Maureen uh, mentioned, we uh, will be uh, participating in a hearing uh, coming up uh, this month. It's now July. 
um, looking at employment. Um, and as we said, we want to look at uh, the, the span of our membership. So if you don't have anything, that's fine right now, but please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you do have anything, particularly as it relates to employment, so that we can make sure to get that included um, in our uh, upcoming hearing that we have available. Uh, Maureen, did you have a, a comment? Yeah, if I could add, um, one of the things I would love to hear um, for those of you who have either switched to a telework position or um, have had your time cut back or have been laid off because of COVID, as you're coming back to work, whether that be finding a job or coming back to the physical office, what are your biggest concerns? I know, you know, we've been teleworking at the national office for a while and we're getting ready to head back into the office. And because of the DOD stop move, I'm actually geographically separated from my husband. So therefore a single parent. And I'm afraid to use the public transportation system because if I catch COVID, I run the risk of not only getting sick and leaving my kids without a parent to take care of them, um, but I also could give it to my kids. And so concerns like that, or you know, maybe you're not the one that's working, but your spouse or significant other is, what are your concerns with them going back into the physical workplace? Or for those that already are, what, what issues are you facing because of that? Another thing is a single mom geographically right now is, is what about childcare? What do I do for that? And is that a concern for, for you all? And, and if it is, those are kind of the things that I'd really like to hear. Um, how is COVID impacting your, um, your employment? And then for those of you who don't have a job but are looking for a job, um, has COVID impacted your job search? You know, you, one of the interesting things that, that Susan Prokop has, has brought up is perhaps the interview process going online has actually reduced some of the discrimination that might occur because they can't always tell what our disabilities are through a webcam versus an in-person interview. And so, you know, as you're thinking of looking into a job, what are some of your concerns? What are some of the things you've seen that have, that have changed that you'd like to see stay that way? Um, those are the kind of things I would love to hear about. Thank you, Maureen. Do we have a, a questioner? No, I think we can move on to more general questions. Um, if there's anything anybody wants to share, you can feel free to use the Q&A box, the chat box, raise your hand. I would like to note real quick, um, our last question there, um, and we can discuss this in general questions, was if there are any concerns about community care. That's a, an area that uh, we know there are issues um, and would like to hear if there are any community care concerns whenever you get sent out from the VA that you'd like to raise. We have LaQuantis has their hand up. All right, LaQuantis, go ahead. Okay, hi, thanks again. Um, so I'm a, I'm a business owner and I wanted to know, um, COVID-19 has affected me, meaning I'm a veteran, I'm a woman-owned business, minority-owned business, but I don't know, I hear them talking about what they're doing for small businesses, but somehow the veteran-owned businesses have been looking for grants and et cetera, et cetera, to help me, but what are they doing for veteran-owned businesses and then more specifically the women veteran-owned businesses? That's my one question. And then um, I had a question about... Um, you, there was a slide and they were talking about education and um, something about, um, I, I, I put down here like for new injuries, like I, even though I was a new injury way back when, there was a lot of information that I could not get from the VA because they didn't have the knowledge. I had to go to um, the Miami Project, the Cure for Paralysis, and then they, I kind of went to that group and then they were kind of helping me throughout, you know, throughout my time of knowing them when, when they had programs they would talk about sex and, um, you know, boyfriend, well, not spouses and all stuff like that. But because I didn't get it, I didn't get that much from the VA. I did get a video from Dr. Perez, but it was like an old video. So I don't know what's, I still don't know a lot about it because it's like a, no one talks about it. I don't know where to go. So I don't know what we do because if you're, if you're paralyzed from the waist down, like what do you do? How do you, so those are all the, the questions that I never really got answered when I got newly injured. So more um, education for those that are new injured and maybe older, older injuries that just don't know certain things. So well, thank, thank you, you. Uh, again for, 
for those comments um, and and certainly we will we will take those back. I am not aware of specific grants for veteran owned uh, businesses, but that is also not an area that we have been uh, necessarily focusing on, but we will uh, take that back and see um, if there's any specific information that we can uncover um, and we can reach out to you directly to make sure that you have that information. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, we have Tammy. All right, Tammy, go ahead. Thanks, um, Laquantis. If I, if I can speak to Laquantis um, as far as the sexuality goes and many years ago, um, when I, I was I was injured over 30 years ago and, and some of the ladies can will be able to relate to this is to um, the when it came to sexuality the, the, the poor nurse that uh, brought me her information brought me a book that was from 1967 and uh, she goes <laughs> she goes I'm sorry Tammy but there is just hardly and nothing there isn't very much out there for women um, and so uh, I said uh, I said it's okay, and and so yes, uh, as far as research goes, and and um, uh, what we can work towards is finding research opportunities and discuss. And, and as Maureen said, you know, we start to have this conversation amongst us uh, to find out uh, what information is out there. And each VA, unfortunately, each SCI center has a different level of, of sexuality. Uh, uh, that they are that that they offer. Um, so uh, what we can do as the committee and through the FAC is is um, maybe start to ask that question to see what they offer the, their spinal cord injury and disease population, um, what they offer as far as sexuality goes, and then we can report back to the Hill and to uh, Baco to say, okay, this is this is where it's lacking and this is where we can grow. So, Back to you, Heather and Maureen and Marissa. Great, thank you. And, and Maureen had something to add quickly. Yeah, something that I forgot to, to mention is um, there is a, a, a collaborative research project going on to create a national woman veteran needs assessment. And because of testimony that we gave on the Hill about a month ago, they actually reached out to PVA and are working to ensure that um, women veterans with spinal cord injuries and diseases are being included in this, this veteran assessment. Um, so, you know, the call and the cry that we have for more research is being heeded, but we have to keep raising our voices to continue to, to get more research. But I just wanted to let you know that, that we, we are being heard. <laughs> That's, that's very good. Um, thank you. Do we have any other questions, Marissa? Nope, I don't think so. Um, so with that, thank you everybody for joining the call today. Um, the webinar will be available on demand. So you will receive a link with the slides as well as the point papers that we were talking about. Um, and we also have a survey that would be great if everyone could please complete. Um, we want to hear your feedback on our webinar topic, um, past and future, and what you would like to see. Um, and please join us for our next webinar. It will be with Heather and Maureen again in September. So thank you, everybody, and have a great day.